Uh, hello, this is Jyoti Dodia from IBM, and I'm really pleased to have Stuart Cunliffe here with us today. So welcome to the first session of this year, and best wishes for 2020. Uh, as you know, this is part of the Power Virtual User Group, Power VUG webin technical webinar series. And I'm really pleased to have Stuart come and tell us and do a one-on-one -on -one session on all things cloud related. So Kubernetes, containers, uh, OpenShift, and so on. So without further ado, let me hand over to him. Thank over you, Jyoti. Okay, I hope you can hear me. Can you hear me, Jyoti? Yes, loud yeah. and clear. Excellent. I hope it stays that way. I'm, um, I'm still recovering from a bit of man flu, so if I uh, start coughing, uh, apologies. So, um, yes, as, as Jyoti said, my name is, is Stu Cunliffe. I work for IBM Systems Group Lab Services here in the UK. Um, thank you all for joining. Um, I think we've got an hour and a half today. Um, I will try and answer questions as we go along. Um, if there's any I don't know the answer to, um, I'll get back to you. If we run out of time and have posted a question, then I think what Jyoti's idea was that we will try and answer all questions and include them with the, the replay uh, as, a, as a document with a replay so we can see those. So, um, a few people still joining, so I'll just give you a quick um, overview. So I, I've worked in lab services now for I think this is my 14th year. Um, covering all things power. I've done a, a couple of these virtual user group presentations before. Um, the last four or five years, one of the areas I've been concentrating on is um, um, cloud within the power environment. So mainly that's really um, involved around power VC in that time scale. But um, the last couple of years, started doing some work around ICP and Kubernetes. And then after our acquisition of um, OpenShift, that's uh, so Red Hat. That's moved on to OpenShift, um, and I did a number of presentations at the Tech University in Prague, where we demoed where I demoed OpenShift and deploying um, containers and VMs and hybrid cloud type of activity. And um, uh, the idea was to repeat a lot of that, but also to um, give some information around the the underlying uh, groundwork of what. Kubernetes is doing, what Docker is doing, what the images are doing, and uh, give everybody hopefully a, a level playing field because we've heard a lot of stuff about OpenShift and Kubernetes in the last um, last year or so. I just wanted to see if we could get a level playing field and obviously where it's relative to IBM systems as well. So um, this was the agenda I hope to cover today. So I'm going to start off with containers and how they relate to their images, and building images, and Docker, and how we can link into Docker Hub. Um, I'm going to do an overview of Kubernetes and the infrastructure and the architecture around Kubernetes, how applications are deployed, upgraded, how we access the containers, a bit about storage around containers, and then how that relates to OpenShift, how OpenShift uses Kubernetes and does a little bit extra around that air architecture from a power perspective, how we would go about installing it, where we would run it, um, and then hopefully some demos around actually using OpenShift to build a number of um, basic applications and um, finishing off with a little bit about the cloud pack, specifically the multi-cloud manager cloud pack and how that delivers cloud automation manager, allowing us to integrate multiple hybrid clouds, including our own power VM estate. So hopefully that's what everybody was uh, expecting. Um, let's crack on. Okay, so fundamentally what OpenShift is delivering from its, uh, it, it is the idea of power series as well. Mm -hmm. The idea of uh, containers. So. Hopefully you all know what a container is, but I've, I've written their Docker containers. There are other container runtime interfaces available, but I'm specifically going to talk about Docker today. So we've, those of you who've been around long enough know that traditional hardware installations, um, we had a single server, we installed an OS on top of it, and we put one, two applications on top of that. Then we came down to the virtualization, the hypervisor era where 
we place a hypervisor on that server, then that server could be split up into various virtual machines or in Power World or LPARs, and then each of those had its own operating system and applications running on top of it. So container virtualization is the next level. It is the virtualization of the operating system. So it takes, we, we, we have a, a VM or a piece of hardware, whichever it is, and we install a Linux operating system on that. And then what happens there is that the, the kernel is shared across all these different containers that get built across the, the environment. Each one then, all it needs to have from, for that, to run that container are the libraries and the application that it wants to run. By nature, a container is an ephemeral piece of software. So in other words, it loads up, it runs the piece of work it wants to do, and then it, it finishes. So we, that could be a single application job, or it could be a long running job that is there for, until the application dies or the application is stopped by the users. So Docker allows us to create, deploy, and run those applications within the containers. They're lightweight, they should be standalone, they should only have in there the libraries and the tools that are required. They don't need the whole operating system. So the advantages of that is, well, they're very lightweight, they're isolated, they only contain, as I mentioned, the libraries and binaries. So if you're doing an upgrade, you don't you might necessarily need to upgrade the whole operating system. They're normally very small, less than 100 megs, some are a little bit bigger than that, as you could expect, depending on what they're going to do. You can consolidate an awful lot of these containers into a single VM or, or bare metal server. And if you split out an application, so each one of these processes, each one of these containers is a microservice, you could upgrade just that level of microservice or just that um, piece of the code. You don't have to upgrade the whole monolithic application. So we can decouple, we can, we can uh, allow developers to work on various parts of the application without affecting the whole application. There are some disadvantages. It's only uh, Linux-based, um, obviously multiple Linux-based. We could run, for example, an Ubuntu container on a host that's running Red Hat. That's fine. It's a shared Linux kernel. Um, there are some sharing of the kernels, so we've got to think about any vulnerabilities where maybe a root user could hack out their container and get access to the kernel. And if we split out an application with lots and lots and lots of different types of of containers, we've got to manage all of all of those containers. Pages are not working. So a container runs by effectively loading, unpacking an image, creating a container, running that image that, that we've that we've we've brought down from a repository. So I've got a couple of examples here about where we can get these containers images from. So we've got Docker there and we've got Red Hat, there's a lot more, but let me just show you a couple of those um, examples. Put that down. Okay, I can't see it's off my screen. So th this is Docker Hub. So Docker Hub is a place where, cust where companies place their images, where, where individuals place their images. Uh, for example, here on, I'm on the IBM um, MQ one. We can have a look at my, so if we look at IBM in general, IBM's got, uh, Web C Liberty, for example, there's the Web C Liberty um, image. It tells us on here what type of environment it can be run on. So here we've got an image that's the next the 386, an A and D, a PPC 64 little engine. So we know that this image would run on power if we wanted to run it on. And then we've also got our own repositories. So I've got a number of repositories down here on code that I've been working on for the last six months. And inside of those is images, tag information, what I've put into that information. So pretty cool. So I don't know how you can get rid of that. Sorry, I'm just trying to pull my tabs back up. There we go. So there's this is Red Hat's repository. So the container images within Red Hat. So these are obviously um, subscription based ones. If we look down here, we can filter our PPC 64 Little Endian. So this is only the images that will run on power. We've got we've got nearly 500 of them, which is pretty good. Seems though I seem to remember only a few months ago there was 380. So we've got ones that do different type of um, activity, different categories. Um, if you look at the top one here, for example, we've got an actual base OS. So we've got a true RHEL 7 container image here that we could pull down. It tells us about this image, gives us a bit of information about it, tells us how to pull it down, which I'll show you in a minute. Uh, it's got some technical details on there. 
and it's got some support information and tags as well. So see which version you want to pull down. So let's say, for example, we wanted to pull down, we'll use this one as an example. So this white screen here, hopefully you can see, is my MacBook, my, my, my laptop. So if I do a, a pull of an image, I'm going to say Docker pull, I've got Docker client installed on my laptop. I'm going to go to that Red Hat registry and I'm going to pull simply that rel image. Now I've not asked it what, what um, architecture to pull. It will know as I connect, it'll have a manifest and it will know which image to pull down to my, my laptop. So I pull that down, it's pulled it down. I actually pulled it down early just to save a bit of time. I can now do a Docker inspect of that image and it shows me what is contained in that image. Now, the reason I want to do this, I want to make sure it's what I expected if I run it, just in case somebody has placed the incorrect image into that repository. But if we look at the information around latest, it tells me a few interesting things. First of all, here, it shows me the command it's gonna run. So when it loads this, this Docker image and creates a container, this is the command it's gonna run. So we can see what it's going to run. Once it's run that command, it's going to quit and turn off the container. Further on down the line here, we can see a few little things about the architecture it's pulled down. We can see information about what it's going to do, the description, what version of Red Hat it is, and then there'll be some further information down here. So for example, the AMD information. Okay, which is exactly what we'd expect. But if we did the same from some this box that I'm on now, is my uh, Red Hat VM box running on a, on a Power 8 server. If I did the same pull from here, it would appear to pull down the same image, go certain goes to the same registry, pull down the same image. If I now inspect that image, you'll see a few things. You'll see, for example, that the command, although it's shown slightly off the bottom screen, is exactly the same. It uses exactly the same repository. However, you'll see that it's pulled down the correct architecture for me. It's pulled down the PPC64 little engine, which is exactly what I wanted to do. But again, it shows me the, the version and the command that it's going to run, the path, the command, and what have you. So all, all well and good. Okay. So what do we want to do if we want to create a new Docker image? So it's fine having those Docker images there. So what we could do is we could pull down that image, we could start a container, we could log on to that container and we could make changes to it. So here we go, I've deployed a base container, uh, we installed new RPMs and we copied files to it. We, and we, we could, if we want to, capture that image. So let's have a, a quick look at that. So let's do, um, let me clear my screen so you can see what I'm doing. So I'm going to here do a Docker run and I'm going to create a container called test one and I'm going to use that image that I pulled down from the Red Hat registry and I'm going to run a bin bash command on it to keep it running in the background so it doesn't die. So I've overwritten the default command by the way there so we can see what's going on. I'm then going to um, log on to that container and there we go. I'm on that container now. I'm um, You can see what OS I'm running. I'm running Red Hat 7.7. .7. If we do an RPM example, we can see that there's probably not many RPMs installed. There's only 160. So there's probably quite a few commands list missing. I think, for example, one of the ones that I know is missing from the base image is host name. So little things like that. They say, well, you don't need the host name command in this image, so you don't need it. I could go along now and do a RPM install, and I could put packages on there, and I could capture that running container as an image if I wanted to. However, it's not very flexible. If every, oops, sorry, if every time I wanted to do that, I'd have to redeploy that image, make the changes myself, and capture that new image. What we prefer, what the, the, the preferred option is, is to create a Docker file, to use a Docker file, which is how you want the image to look, build that image, and then you can use that image to run a container. So exactly the same type of thing. List in the, in, in the left-hand side that I want to add desired configuration to a Docker file. If we look at a Docker file, a Docker file is just a flat file. So here's an example Docker file. Oh, so I can't highlight it because I'm in a just go to laser pointer. There we go. 
So what this Docker file is telling me is that when I build an image using this Docker file, I want to pull down the Ubuntu image from Docker. So it starts with a Docker image. It then runs all these commands against um, Docker, image, Docker containers one at a time. So it tells me the maintainer name, it does an Ubuntu update, it installs NPM, it makes directories, change directories, and users, blah, blah, blah. Exposes a port, copies some files into the, into the container, and then it starts Node-RED. So this is a Node-RED example. So all well and good, and then at the end of it, you're left with one image that has started off as Ubuntu, but now has all these different layers across it. So um, quite a useful image. And then what we, so here's the command to do it. We do a docker build dot. So dot is the location of my Docker file. And then we would tag it with this information. So I'd be left with a, a image on my laptop or my, my VM called no red ICS version 0.8. That's all well and good, but that is on my laptop. What happens if we wanted to do it as a collaboration? What we want to do it as a team? So what we can do is we can actually place that Docker file into GitHub, and we can use exactly the same format within Git, the GitHub Docker file, but this time we do a Docker build. We give it the location within GitHub. So GitHub is a repository where we can keep code. I'll show you that in a minute, and we tag it with the same uh, version. So let me let me show you that. So, so where's my GitHub? So here's my GitHub uh, repository, and there's the Node Red ISIS information that I stated. So that's the URL that we point to, and all I've got in here is a readme file, a couple of files I want to copy, but my Docker file. I click on my Docker file. You can see that that's the list of the commands I wanted to run. So it's going to go and get the Ubuntu one. And it's going to go and run these commands one at a time against that Ubuntu image to create me a default image at the end. So let's let's show that. So I can't see the syntax because I've got a little window in front of it, but I'm thinking that it says Docker build GitHub and it's tagged with my uh, ID, the, the, the image I want to create. I'll go away and do that. Now, it did indeed. Okay, excellent. So you'll notice there were 16 steps in my Docker file. You, as you can see, these 16 steps that are now running uh, individually. Now, what I did to speed things up, I actually cached the version up to step 11. So it actually only started at step uh, 11, step 12, and it will run those commands um, moving forward for, from that step. Because what I wanted to show you was it creates interim containers along the way. So it creates a container runs the next command against it, and then uses that new container to then build another container to run the next step against it, removing each container as it goes along the way. And then what you're left with at the end is a single uh, image from that container. So let me show you. So it's now exposing the port. It's now copying my files across. And it's now starting no red. And it places this into a container. So it's successfully built. And then we've got a number down here. So if I do a docker images and grep for let's grep for that number you'll see here there we go so the name i gave it version 0.8 and it told me it's created 16 seconds ago because nothing's changed and it's cached all those layers within my vm if i run it again it should in theory which back it does so that's what, as you'd expect but what happens if somebody went along and edited this file? So some within Docker, that's within GitHub, they've got access to the master branch. We could be working from a different branch or there's a different copy, which then gets propagated to the master where and when. But for, for, for time scale's sake today, what I'll just, I'll just do is I will, um, I will change something here. So let's say um, I want to add another directory. So let's say, um, run make dir let's have a uh, let's say we wanted a new log file within that directory so i've updated 
the actual base Docker file that it was using to build that image. Commit my change to GitHub, and then back on my VM, if I run it again, if it's recognized that change, there we go. So it's got to step 12, and it said, well, actually, you've, you've created a new run line entry for me. So I'm now going to start building it from the cache version from this step onwards. So again, we'll see that go through. So those changes will get pushed through. That new image will get created. And I can now use that new image to build a container should I, should I wish to. Now, I won't run this container for now because it's, uh, again, we've, we've only got an hour and 10 minutes. So I'm going to crack on really with the Kubernetes. Um, side of things. But what I will do, if I show you my current images within Docker, so we noticed here that within this container, so my, my Kunlis no Red ISIS um, repository, I've got a version 7. If I now push the version I just created up, and obviously it's now version 8, what we'll see is that it's going to start pushing this image uh, on the layers that it needs to, because every single um, uh, action within that Docker file was effectively a new layer. Some of those are already cached, and it says it's pushed it up. So if I go back onto my Docker image now and do a refresh, look at the newest. There we go. So there's my my version. Eight container now. Image, sorry. Now the good thing here is if you look at my my build history, my image history, you'll recognise all these commands that I I had in my image file. In my, and there, for example, is my make directory node red. It tells me that the command it ran up here. If you look at my um, make directory here, my command bash. So if it's been well created Docker image files, you should be able to look within Docker and see that the commands that were run to create that Docker and then the, that Docker image and then the final command, how it's going to start. So as well as inspecting it, before you even pull it down, you can actually inspect the image from that state. Okay. So that's essentially what we've done. We pulled it down, we've built it, we've used that image from forth. Now, if I ran that, if I created a container using that image, that's all well and good. So I've shown an example there. I've started up a, a container called Mino Red. I've opened a port for it, and I've used, told it which image to use. That's all well and good. That will work. But what happens if that container fails? What happens if I want to upgrade that container to a new version of No Red ISIS? What happens if I want to scale it? A Docker... Um, container on its own is not not useless, but what we need to do is put some sort of control, some sort of scheduling around that. Some sort of, that's where Kubernetes comes in. So Kubernetes is the orchestrator that manages these containers across our estate. So it's there so it can fire up containers, it can scale them up, scale them down, it can take action so something happened to one of those containers, and it allows us to monitor and update and Add storage to those containers. Let's put an application together and deliver that application as a service. Now, Kubernetes itself has been around for some time now. It was originally a Google um, offering. Um, Google called it Borg, and they released it to the uh, community a number of years ago. Um, there's a number of offerings at the bottom that we can see that use Kubernetes. So there's IBM KS, and there's um, Azure, have got version AKS, um, Amazon, and obviously Red Hat OpenShift is based on Kubernetes. So interesting fact that uh, Kubernetes, when it's called Borg and it was released, they wanted to call it um, Seven of Nine in reference to a star, that's right, Star Trek character who was a Borg. Uh, but um, copyright wouldn't allow them, so they ended up um, calling it Kubernetes. And the, the seven uh, handles on the wheel are in reference to the seven of nine, apparently. So, uh, yeah. so at a high level, what does Kubernetes do? This? Well, Kubernetes is effectively a cluster. We'll talk about how a cluster works in a bit, so masters and worker nodes. And it's also the orchestration around how we want our applications within Kubernetes to look, how we want our Docker 
our containerized environment to look. So how many, where, what if? So let's break that down to a little bit of a terminology. So Kubernetes terminology. So I'll break these down in the next few slides, but a node is a, a VM or a server. So the VM can be a virtual machine. It can be based in the cloud. It can be based on premise, or it can be a bare metal server that's running your um, Linux version um, that runs the workload. So we've got the idea of masters and worker nodes, which I'll discuss. So a node tends to be referenced to a worker node. At the moment, I've been talking about containers Kubernetes using reference of pods. So for, for now, we'll just reference, if you uh, will start using the word pod, I mean a container. So a pod contains one or more containers. Normally a pod contains one container. So a pod is basically a wrapper around a container and the pod is the smallest unit that Kubernetes um, works with. A project is a like a C space type, a namespace type area. So it's restricted space within the shared environment. So You'll see in my, 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 my demos that I've got various projects uh, or namespaces, as, as they're called, where we can restrict access to certain images, certain containers, to a certain group of people. Service is how our pods communicate with each other. I'll go into that and how we expose a route to the external communications as well in the next couple of slides. And a deployment. How does Kubernetes deliver a application to uh, to the user via a deployment, and we'll talk about the deployments um, as well. So high-level architecture, we have our master or masters um, running a number of services that I'm going to talk about, and we have our worker node or worker nodes, which effectively run a container runtime environment, and they run the, um, the kubelet process, which is effectively the Kubernetes client and a kubeproxy, which is the, the Netflix side of things. They have pods in there. In this example, they do show multiple containers in some pods, but let's just assume our pods are going to be like number two on the top one, where it's one container, one pod. And we have a user interface at the left hand side where people come into the master. So all communications by default to all our worker nodes, all our applications come via the masters. And we can use our, um, our own Kube CTL, so we can use the container, uh, the Kubernetes client to connect to our Kubernetes master, should we need to. The masters are the control plane of what happens within a Kubernetes cluster. So at a high level, they've only really got four functions. They're an API server, so everything is API based within Kubernetes. So it validates, configures pods, it does all the service and replication controllers, which I'll talk about in a bit. It tells which node to take a pod and synchronize that information across. So it's the entry point of the, the cluster. The data store or the ETC database is a distributed database that holds the configuration of how that cluster should look. So not only the information about the um, master pods, but also the information about the client pods, the application pods that are running on our worker nodes. The ETC database does not have to be part of the um, Kubernetes cluster. If you wanted to put that on a separate VM outside of Kubernetes control, so you could back it up, the method that you wanted to back it up, if you wanted to be able to place it onto your own infrastructure, you can do that so because that is the stateful part of how it should look. If you wanted to restore a Kubernetes cluster, then obviously you have to have the data store to be able to tell that cluster how to build itself when it came down. And the, another function is the scheduler. So it works out new tasks that are needed and it assigns them to the healthy network node. And then one of the key areas is the controller manager. So the controller manager controls, there's lots of different controllers running within Kubernetes, things like the you know, replica controller. It is the manager of those. So it keeps an eye on all the controllers that are running across the environment to make sure your, your configuration matches what it's meant to match in the configuration database. From a worker node perspective, the worker nodes are the, are the muscle of, of, the, of the Kubernetes clusters. So they, they watch out, they only really do three things. They watch out for API service from the, work, from the master nodes and take work assignments. They then execute that assignment, that application onto itself by creating pods, drawing down the image, doing the work that needs to be done. It then reports back to the masters, the control plane. This is my current state, this is my current state. So it's constantly feeding back the information that it's current state. 
The reason it does that will be clear in a minute why it does that. So as I said, the, the worker nodes can be metal or VMs. They communicate via authentication certificates to the master, and they just consist of a, a, a few um, processes at the bottom that are, I've listed there. So. So we talked about pods, containers, and worker nodes. So I wanted to explain something that's quite key to Kubernetes, and that's around services and, and routing. So if we've got an example here where we've got a couple of pods that are running within a worker node. So we've got an application pod and a database pod. They will we use internally, we use um, virtual switching, so they would all be given private IP addresses. Now, they could communicate on those private IP addresses, but we have a few issues around that. So what we introduce is a service. So as each application gets given a service. So in this case, we've got an application service and we've got a database service. The application knows which pods and endways are running within, pods stroke endpoints are running within the application and forwards information to those pods or vice versa. They communicate to each other, so the application, application or database pods communicate via their service. Now, that's fine. If it's a one-to-one, -one, we can see that it's a fairly uh, moot point, so it's not really needed. But what happens when we add a second replication, for example? So we want another pod to load balance our application. We've now got two IP addresses, because these IP addresses are random. Remember, these um, pods are ephemeral. They'll start and they'll stop. They'll keep changing their IP addresses depending on what state the cluster is in. We don't want to have to try and tell the database, server, oh, by the way, the application is now also running on 10.10.10.2 as well as 10.10.10.1. The application service takes care of that for us. It just forwards the, the load to whichever one it sees fit, depending on how you've got the load configuration set up. What happens if a pod dies? If a pod dies, then Kubernetes or OpenShift will try and restart that pod. There's no guarantee it will come up on the same IP address. In fact, it won't come up on the same IP address. So now we've got a, uh, a pod on a different IP address, but it doesn't matter because the service is still the same. The service is just forwarding now to its own endpoints. The services are good for within inside the cluster. What happens if we want to ac access our application from outside the cluster? Well, a service is exposed as an external route via the master API services, and the service and that the route then points to a particular service. So in this case, we've got an application route that we've added. Uh, we've got a website, for example, this application must be a HTTP service. We can now access the application.com through the, the application.com must result to our master API server. Our API server knows how to forward that on to the, the respective pods underneath. So in terms of deployment, um, Deployment really consists of three separate areas. We've got a deployment configuration, and this I'm going to talk quite a bit about deployment configurations this afternoon. And um, a deployment configuration describes the desired state of an application or a component of an application. We'll see, see a couple of examples. Kubernetes or OpenShift is constantly looking at the desired state compared to the current state and seeing if anything differs. If anything differs, it knows how to take action to make that current state match the desired state. The desired state is a flat YAML file, so we can edit it anytime, we can import it at any time, we can do what we want with that YAML file. It's not hidden, it's a flat file that we can manipulate. For our replication controllers, they get fired up when we build a configuration, and then our pods, they get fired up when we build a configuration. We don't really have to worry about these bottom two, we have to worry about the deployment configuration that we basically set at, at the time. So I'll show you some examples of deployment configuration. Here is an example of deployment configuration. So this is just a flat YAML file. It's actually normally three or four pages long. I've just split it into two sections and highlighted some of the key areas. So we can see that it's a, an API call. We said, and then we have these things called kinds. So we, we defined, defined a deployment configuration flat file. We've given it a couple of labels, which are key when we're defining things like services. And then we specify what we want this application to look like. That's basically all we're trying to do is a flat file configuration. So I want this deployment to look like this. We want it to have one replica, and we want it to use this image. So all the information I've been saying about images earlier, this is where it starts using this information. So it says, I'm going to use this image from this repository. If it's not down, I'm going to pull it. I'm going to pull it down from Docker if it's not in my local repository. I've then got some 
liveliness probe. So in other words, to make sure that my, my uh, container is, is running when it's up and running. And then I'm going to expose port 1880 on TCP on this port, on this container when I've started it up. I'm also going to set some resources down here. I'm going to say that my memory is limited to uh, 512 megabytes. Then we can use that deployment configuration to build an application and it will go away and match that information. Then if something changes, if for example, a replica goes to zero, then Kubernetes knows to make that replication one. So it knows to restart an application to match that deployment configuration. Now, Kubernetes and Docker or, or runtime environments aren't, uh, aren't um, they, they are complementary technologies. We have people developing within their favorite languages, they pack the, package the image up, they test the image, and then what we can do, we can ship it into Kubernetes and we can place a container runtime and a content a deployment configuration, so I've gone the wrong way, around it. And then that will load and run within the cluster. So what about OpenShift? So OpenShift container platform, um, is the product that we install. We install our own infrastructure. Uh, we need a paid for subscription to be able to run. We can run OpenShift in uh, cloud as an offering. Um, we match, so OpenShift is Kubernetes. Um, uh, version three is currently at the moment, 3.11. It runs on RHEL or RHEL Atomic. Um, version four, which is also out, but it's not yet supported on power and will hopefully be um, this quarter. Actually, the master servers run Red Hat Core OS, which is a trimmed down version of Red Hat Enterprise based. But you can still use RHEL for the compute nodes. So the compute nodes can be power, and we can um, uh, run RHEL on those if we want to. There is an open source version available called um, OKD. Um, and that's, that's the only little differences between that's what OpenShift uh, container platform is. So, when we install OpenShift container platform, what options do we have? Well, there's, there's lots of different options. So if we look at the basic solution, so we can do an all-in-one solution. So we've got a single VM here or a single server. We've installed, we've installed Red Hat on it, and we've installed the worker and the master functionality on that. This is called the all-in-one environment, and it's very good for basic testing and, and, and doing that sort of environment for. We've also got the idea of a separate master and worker, which is the environment that I'll be using today, where we've got one master server, one worker node. These are both VMs in my case. They're actually both running on the same physical server, but they're both power rate VMs running RHEL 7.6, I think. And we define one as a master and one as a worker for the installation. We've then got the highly available environment that we want in a production environment. So if we start from the bottom, we've got multiple worker nodes, depending on the side of your size your applications are going to run. We've got multiple master nodes, more master VMs. Because we've got multiple master VMs, we need a load balancing uh, solution in front. And we've got multiple um, data store nodes, so ETCD nodes. And as I said before, you don't have to have those ETC nodes um, within the cluster. You can have them as separate VMs if you want. Now, this configuration is very, very interchangeable. This is just an example of a production cluster. We can have separate infrastructure nodes if we want. We could have um, a, an, odd, an even number of master nodes because it's low balance. As long as we've got an odd number of um, data store ETC nodes, the quorum, then that's the domain advantage. So I've got a I've got a, a production environment which has got multiple master nodes and multiple worker nodes, and I've got a uh, the one in the middle as well, um, and, and both work perfectly well. From an installation perspective, the masters can run on power nine or power eight. They can be bare metal or they can be VMs. Um, minimum recommended for virtual CPUs. Um, from a physical count, I would recommend two physical cores um, from the testing that I've been doing. Um, from a, um, a memory perspective, I would recommend 32 gig, especially if you've got EDCD running in on those master nodes. And then if you've got other things running like cloud packs, I would size those equivalently and put more memory in those. Also, we've got to remember the amount of pods does uh, influence the size of the master nodes. Um, 
the we've got a uh, configuration here where we set an extra core, an extra one and a half gig of memory for every thousand pods. So try and work out the size, the number of pods that you're going to be running, and use that to affect the master node. From the worker node's perspective, we've got um, again IBM Power Nine or Power Power Eight. Uh, I'd recommend one core plus some overhead of at least ten percent and a memory of sixteen gig. So uh, put a bit, bit down there about the, the sizing. From a software perspective, um, we, as long as we've got a VM that is running uh, RHEL, we can use it as a, uh, as, a, as a worker node or a master node. So the actual installation is done by Ansible playbooks. But um, what we need to do is we need to ensure that that VM has access to a RHEL repository, which is usually by a subscription manager. DNS is working across all the um, all the nodes. We use DNS MASQ as well, by the way, to propagate the installation. So each node works as its own DNS server. We need SE Linux set to enforcing. If you've got proxies, so you need to make sure the proxy for local, so it's not going through the proxy for your local VMs. And then we've got oh, sorry, it's very noisy in here. So we start a meeting next door and they're very loud. We need to install the uh, Ansible OpenShift, OpenShift Ansible to be able to do the installation. We need Docker and we need to exchange public SSH keys from the Ansible server in the hosts. I've put some software prerequisites down at the bottom as well. So, so when we install. Can I just interrupt? Sorry, yeah. Stu. Um, so, I'm getting um, some people requesting to be added to the mailing list for the series. So, I, I will do that. If you have already subscribed um, and um, are receiving emails from me directly, then you do not need to to be added again. Uh, registration is just once to the whole series. Um, so that hopefully clarifies things. And if you've got any questions or comments, please add them to the chat window. Thanks, Stu. Hello. Sorry, Hi. I've just run next door to ask people to be quiet. <laughs> no worries. OK. You're good to go. I'm good to go. So. When we install Ansible, OpenShift Ansible, it creates a configuration file. Those who use Ansible before will probably recognize this type of um, this type of configuration file. In this example, we've got one master and one worker. We tell it which components we want to install, which servers we want to be master, which ones we want the data store on, and then at the bottom, what we want that node to do. So we've got master infrastructure, master compute. So we've got a two node cluster here. Fairly simple, but on a more complex one where we've got um, three masters and two workers, we need to install a load balancer. So we have to identify a load balancer that we're going to use. We um, create three masters. We've got DTCD run across those three masters. And at the bottom, we can see we've got three master infrastructures, in this case, two worker nodes. What we then do is we run the first playbook, which is called prerequisite.yaml. And Ansible goes away and does, runs 23 plays consisting of 211 tasks across all these nodes, load balancers, and master nodes, and worker nodes, makes any changes it needs to do, and comes back. This one was only in five minutes. We then run the main one, which is the deploy cluster. Now, deploy cluster takes a bit longer. In this case, it took mine 50 minutes to run. There's 146 plays, and in total, there's nearly 18,000 tasks it runs across those VMs to configure an OCP cluster on our power VMs. So quite a lot of tasks. If you're doing it manually, weren't using the playbooks, obviously I can imagine there's an awful lot of chance of getting uh, get coming across any sort of errors. But OK, so let's have a quick look at OpenShift. So hopefully this will now make a bit more sense. I'm just going to piece together these areas around the architecture to show you what OCP or OpenShift delivers. Runs on our choice of infrastructure, so physical, virtual, private, public cloud. We have a number of nodes where RHEL will run the applications. We have pods or containers that run the actual applications contained within them. It runs those as a unit, so it drags down an image from somewhere, whether that's a local repository or a remote repository. It builds a container using that and wraps it up within a pod. Okay. We then have the masters, which orchestrate the nodes and the applications across the cluster. Uh, a number of um, uh, master functions, API key, key value stores, scheduler that we've spoken about, stores those in the local registry. We have a service layer that allows, in this case, we've highlighted pod 
MongoDB and an Apache pod so they can communicate with each other. And we have a replication management interface within, uh, within the master which looks at the configuration, says that configuration doesn't match because something's happened. I'm going to take action and maybe rebuild a pod for you. Okay. It recovers failed pods. Now, we do have persistent volumes within, um, within, um, uh, within uh, OpenShift. Um, we can use a number of storage solutions, NFS, uh, the channel, um, Cinder with an open stack, ClusterFS, iSCSI. We can use flex volume drivers, so we can link it to PowerVC. And, the, and the, the, new in, the new standard, the CSI driver, which is the container storage interface, I put a link to it at the bottom. So that is now available on um, Spectrum Scale, so we can link our Spectrum Scale servers uh, storage to the uh, configuration. And the, the container SI allows um, OpenShift to consume storage from storage uh, backends that are implement the CSI driver as a persistent driver. So moving forward at the moment, it's in tech preview mode for 3.11 on power, but it's supported in, in 4. Then we have the routing layer that exposes to external users the, the pods that we've created, the applications that we're running. And all this is controlled by developers or operators that come in via the master. So hopefully that makes uh, better sense and pieces together how Kubernetes and OpenShift um, look. Now, if we look at actual OpenShift itself, so here we've got three windows. I'm actually going to go to my OpenShift browser now. Here is my OpenShift browser. So we've got three effectively windows. We've got service catalog, an application console, and a cluster console. All the service catalog is is a list of um, well, it's a service catalog that we can deploy from our Kubernetes window should we have, and the back on the side, a list of projects that we've currently got. So there's my project. Some projects are, um, are default to Kubernetes, or to OpenShift, should I say, like the Kube system one, the OpenShift one. So these are, these are um, restricted projects, but I'm logged in at this moment as an administrator so I can see them all. And David Spurway has got a project as well. But what I can do now is I'm the administrator, I can look at the cluster console as well. Within here, I can see my projects. There's my lab services project, for example. Um, it can show me the nodes I'm running. So here are here are the nodes. Um, I can look at what storage I've got defined. If I've got any storage, oh, yeah, I've got a couple of storage, and what pods I'm currently running. And deployment configs. So we talked about deployment configs earlier. So these are the ones I've currently got loaded. I've got a MongoDB one and a Node Red one. If I look at the Node Red one, for example, and then look at the YAML, YAML file, you'll recognize it's very similar to the YAML file that I showed you on the, on the screen earlier. Okay. Now I can obviously look at other um, projects because I'm, um, I'm an administrator. If we go here, for example, we can see uh, that we've got. Oh, go to that one. But we can look at different metrics. We can look at administrators. We can see which pods are going. And we see here that I've got a crashed loop pod. So I can look at that one. And yep, yeah, it's told me that one of my pods, one of my multi cluster hub pods, is, is, is faulty. I can go in there, have a look at the logs, look at the terminal if I wanted to, and, and find out what's going on. Then the last one I wanted to show you from the console, then we'll get into it a little bit more, is the application console. So let me log back in because it's a separate user ID um, and pick my project, my lab service. Now what this shows me now is all my deployments that are within this project. So I'm currently running a Node Red deployment. I'm currently running a Mongo deployment, and I can see how many pods each one's running. And what's going on with each environment? It tells me here, for example, what image it used, how many pods it's running, what my service is, and what my route into this application is. So if I click on that, yeah, it takes me to my my Node Red application that's running within that environment. So that's that's pretty cool. So what in, in here we've also got things like we can add storage, we can look at builds, we can look at individual pods should we need to, but 
what I'm going to show you now is we're going to do something from um, the command line. So let's have a quick look. So let me clear that. So if I do a OC, OC, which is the command line interface, sorry, for OCP, look at projects. I'm not logged in, so that doesn't help. So I do OC login, OCP admin, password. It shows me the list of all those projects, and it by default takes me into the last project I was in. So it takes me into lab services. So I do an OC get pods. I can see that I've got two pods running. I can describe a pod. So if I do an OC describe pod, let's look at my node red one. You can see here it gives me information about my pod. So it tells me the name, it tells me when it was created, when it started, it tells me the IP it's on, it tells me the replication controller and the sum works, you'll tell me the image, here we go. There's the image, it's running my node red version 1.4, which port it's listening on and what have you. Okay, so we notice that this is listening on, this pod is running on that IP address, so ends in 244. We mentioned the fact that we've got services um, working with this. So if I do see get services, I can see I've got an OC, I've got a couple of services. If I do a OC describe service node, node red, it tells me at the moment I've got one endpoint. It tells me it's listening and it's listening on endpoint. 244180, which is what we saw earlier, which is IP address we saw earlier. If I wanted to increase those number of pods to two, I could simply click on the scale option there. What that's going away now and doing is building a second pod. I can see this if I click on my deployment number here. So I'm currently on deployment number five, and I've got two now. So one is, is just starting, so that's going to take a few seconds to come online. There you go. So that's now online. I can look at that information here now. So if I do an OC get pods, you'll notice that there's two node red SNC pods. And if I look at the service that is providing that, you'll hopefully see that I've now got two endpoints. So my service is now moving those two endpoints. I can edit that if I wanted to, but what I'm gonna do for you now, I'm gonna create a new deployment. I'm going to, rather than just um, work on an existing deployment, Let's look at a new deployment. So if I did a, an OC get template. So let's look at the templates that are available for my deployment configuration. So my templates being these in my catalog. So if I look at these, I can see all these templates. And I've got one here called Node Red, which I use to deploy the application that you've just been looking at. And here we can see it. We can see Node Red template. So if I do an OC get node red all it tells me oh, oc get template a red all it tells me is basic information but if i do remember these are all yaml files if i do an o yaml it puts the output into a yaml format and you'll recognize that this gives me the sort of information that we were talking about earlier so deployment config it's got service it's got uh, the deployment config here now I could simply direct that into another file and edit it, but let's I've created a, uh, a predefined one here. So I've got a base YAML file. So all this is is a base YAML file. If I go into here, I've, I've sectioned them off with hashes so we can see. I want to create a template. So the template will appear on my OCP catalog page. I want to create a service. So I'm going to give it a name. I'm going to tell it it's going to listen on port 1880. I'm going to create a route so I can get to it from outside. I'm going to get called the same name that I call it. I'm going to create my deployment config. So this is the information that really tells it how it's going to look. So I want one replica. I'm going to use this image from no red version 1.3. And I'm going to be a rolling upgrade should I choose to do an upgrade of this service, which I will show you. And a little bit more information about some parameters. So the parameters here are just how I want it to look when it comes into my catalog. So all that is is a YAML file that I can get from anywhere. Every single API that is based within Kubernetes or OpenShift 
can be viewed in YAML format. So all I have to do now is to create that, that template, is do an OC create minus F and then the name of the template. Now, I've not told that I want to create a template. I've not told it I want to create a deployment config. It knows from that YAML file what's in there. So hopefully it's going to go on the building. So it says it's created. So OC get templates. There we go. So there's the node red VUG template that I create. So back on my catalog, if I refresh my catalog, we should see the node red VUG. There we go. So all I have to do now as a user who's got access to this catalog, I give it a click on it, deploy next, give it a name. So this is where I add the unique name here. So let's call this VUG, keep everything simple. And then I'm going to go away and do a, a create. Okay, there we go. So here is the one being deployed now. So this is going away, getting that node red image that I asked it to, and building a pod from that or a container from that image. It's then applying that deployment de 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 configuration to that pod. It's created a service address and it's created a router. Now it's starting up that pod. Hopefully, if that was a valid image name I gave it, it should start. So it's now gone dark blue. So as it says it started, let's have a check. So if I do an OC get pods now, I can see node red VUG number one has started. Cool. And then back here, I've now exposed a route to it. So I should be able to click on that and I should get my node red pod up that I asked for. Excellent. Okay, so what we can do now, I, you, you saw me increasing the uh, the number of pods before, but we could just edit that. So that is a, a YAML file underneath. So if I go into deployment configuration and edit the YAML again, you'll notice this is exactly what we had down here before. You'll see somewhere that there's replicas. So if I just change that YAML file to replica two, look, should see here now it's now increasing the number from one to two so when that light blue becomes dark blue then it started up a second part it's still the same deployment because it hasn't had to change any configuration information so it's still left that, that first one running and if we now look under that we should now see that there is in fact two VUG pods running under the same application so that allows us to be able to to increase it should we should we choose. Likewise, we could decrease some pods. So I edited the YAML file before. I'm actually just going to do it by the GUI and that will scale down to one. So this is scaling up. So we've deployed, we scaled up, we scaled down. We can set automatic scaling if we wanted to. At the moment I've just got it set to manual, which is which is fairly cool. So that's just the scaling section. What happens if we wanted to do something a little bit more uh, complex? What if we wanted to do a rolling upgrade? So say that we, the image that we used here, I think was version 1.3 of my node red code. What happens if we decided actually, I built a new image um, on Docker and it's version 1.4. What would we, we do at this point? So we wait for this to the scaling to complete, which is done. And I can go back into the YAML file again and edit the YAML file. You notice down here it was 1.3. If I change 1.4, so the minute I change this, the deployment configuration does not match the current deployment. So what should happen is it will recognize it straight away. It says, okay, something's happening. I'm now creating a new pod on version 1.4. And once that new pod is created and running, I will scale down my old pod to zero and turn it off effectively. So there we go. It's now scaled it down. So now we've got one pod running, change the configuration number because we've got it. It's a new name. It's using a new image. If I click on the actual route again, it should still take me to the same um, node red interface. There we go. So still my node red interface is working. If I wanted to delete that completely, if I had had enough, I could just delete the whole configuration deployment. Configuration deployment will then get rid of the actual pods that were running. There we go. So it's going down. 
And as I try to click on it, it should eventually fail. Yes, yeah, so that's no longer working as you'd expect. Okay, I keep forgetting I've got slides. So these are the three demos that I, I'm going to run. I've already run the top one. So I created a template from a new configuration deployment, deployment configuration. So that uses the existing Docker image that was out on Docker Hub. Okay. I'm going to do two more as well. I'm going to do a source to image where we, so this is, this is very clever. This, I'll explain how this works in a minute. And then at the, at the end, I'm going to do an installation via, um, I'm going to build some Power VMs using VM images from our current cloud environment. So if we look at this second one, the source to image, the source to image, what this is basically doing, it's taking some pre-built images, which are a default are already installed in OCP. And as you deploy using those images, it injects your code from GitHub. So if you've got an application that's maybe written in Python or, uh, or, um, or PHP or HTTP, what it does, it injects just your code into the image. So you don't have to keep building a new image from the source code. It has the source code already available in OCP for you. So let's have a, a quick look at some of those images. So if I go to, they're all still stored in a, a, a namespace, an application, a project called um, OpenShift. And I look at them in here, so here we go. So here, ones we've got, we've got Java, we've got Perl, we've got PHP, we've got Python, we've got HTTP. Okay, so let me go back to my own catalog entries. So here we go. So this is my catalog entry. Here are my languages. Here's my middleware, what have you. So what I want to do, I want to build a new web server, new website. So I'm going to look at my Git server. If I can find under all this, let us go git, git. That looks like git, there we go. I've got a, a, a git repository that all it's got in there is an index file. All it has is a HTTP index file, nothing else. It doesn't have a, an image, it doesn't have a source. It just has an index file here. So here we can see a very, very basic HTML index file. If I call up my source to image build, it's going to go away and drag in, it's going to create a new image and drag in that index file for me. So I give it an application name, so let's call this at one HTTP. I'm going to give it this URL, so in other words, my Git URL. And I'm going to click on advanced options, so you can see some of the advanced options that we've got at the same time. So I could use a different branch if I wanted to. Here I am actually going to give it a root name, so I know, I'll know how to access it. So Stu's web page. Down here, if I wanted to, I could have um, scaling. So if I wanted the pod to automatically scale, in other words, when it gets to a certain percent busy, build me another pod. I could set that. I'm, I'm not going to go for this example. I could set CPU limits, memory limits. And labels. So I'm just going to go ahead and create that now. So what that's done now, you'll see at the top of the deployment, it's actually going to take a little bit longer because what it's actually doing now, it's actually building a new image for me. So it's doing, it's taking the base image, it's building a new container and it's injecting my code for me. It didn't take as long as I thought it was going to take. And it's now started that pod. So it's now going to start me a HTTP container it's going to inject my code into it and it's going to take a, an image copy of that, um, a copy of that image should I need to use it. So in theory, not ready yet, a little bit of time to get going. It's starting the application, push successful, build, Stu's website, there we go, something else just popped up there. I can check on the, the running application. It says it's running, it's telling me all the information about it, tells me which port it's listening on. Back to it again. Let's see if that's working now. There we go. So, as you see, web program isn't my uh, one of my fortes, but this is a very basic HTML web page. Let me just close on the one that failed. There we go. And and there there we have a running information. So, if I wanted to change this, I could. So, for example, if I decided that I was going to change the 
config file. Um, let me change something that I need to change for change. Anyway, so surety context go and I'll try and add some storage later. FS group. Like the image build I did earlier, because it recognized that I've changed something, it's gone away and built a new version. The difference being, you'll notice it's still using build number one. So it's only had to build this once because not the, the source hasn't changed only the configuration change. So the index.html file hasn't changed, so it doesn't need to do a rebuild. And that page should still work. Let me just uh, reload that page. Yep, that's still working. What, what happens if I did change my source program? So if I go back into GitHub and I edit my index.html file, there we go. Okay, so Let's change something very, very basic. So the header said it was Stuart Cunliffe's web page. Let's change that to Stu Cunliffe's web page and commit that change to GitHub. Okay, so GitHub has changed, so the source build has changed. So if I do a new build on that, what that's going to do. Going to the wrong page, if I go to the wrong page. Going to here we go, sorry. So it's gone away and done a new build of my index.html file and then started a new pod from the back of that. So what it's doing is now it's stopping my old one, it's scaling up to my new one, starting my new one and scale down my old one. So if that has worked, we can now see that it's Using the same, but it's now using a new HTML file, and that image is now available to be able to use for, for other things. What if I wanted to add storage to that? So, if I looked at my storage, for example, here, I've got a couple of um, storage claims. So, when we have a we have the, the case of a physical volume, and we claim a physical volume. So, once we put a physical volume claim on a physical volume. That is available, then we can call that in and we can basically use it within our environment. Let me just go down a couple of these pages. So if we look at this one, it tells us that the, the PV name is this. So let me just go onto my um, let's see under my screen, is that one? Yep. Yeah. Let me go onto my um, V7000 and I can see that I've got a volume here that I created earlier, which is two gig, which is currently not mapped. So let's say I want to add storage to that device. So if I go to that application, if I go back to my deployment and add storage, I can choose that, that physical LUN that I already created, define it, give it a mount point, and then add that physical volume claim to my application. And we'll see, see it started version four now. So it's actually started a new build because obviously it's got to stop it and restart it and it attacks that volume. It's, it's gone away and attached that volume to that, to that um, environment. I could create my own storage here. So if I click on create storage, I've only got one storage class, so I can leave that blank. Let's call this test again, VG volume and make it three gigabyte and click on create. Now we get a uh, pending and then it's created the volume claim. So it's now gone, to go, gone away to my V7000 and created that three gigabyte volume. If I click on it, it tells me the physical volume name it used. Um, I could delete it should I want to. Let's let try and show you it first before I delete it. Oh, so there's the one I had earlier. Now we see it's mapped. So basically it's been claimed, it's mapped it to a host and it's because it's mounted that volume. If we click on that one, we can now see that the new one I've just created, the three gig one is available. If I didn't want to use it, I'm just going to go on and delete it to, to, clean, to clean things up. So we've now got a new copy of our HTTP page, which should be working, yep, that's fine. And then if we look at the, the pod it created underneath, it tells that it's created a volume and it's placed it on slash data. We can have a look at that. We can log on to the terminal of that pod. Okay, no, 
And if we look under data, and if I add the, let's just do a DF. We can see it's a two gig data. Now this LUN I actually created yesterday and actually put some data in there. So if I do an LS, I can see there's a config.data file. If I cat config.data, static data from Monday the 14th, and you'll see the date on the actual file is from yesterday as well. So this is basically showing me that it's a persistent storage. So wherever I have mounted that storage and whatever mount point I've given it is brought across. So if we're going to use a configuration file or a database file, we can provide the permanent storage using OpenShift as well. Okay. Right. So we've seen some out of the box OpenShift stuff. So we've seen how we could use an existing um, image to go away and, and do our build. So the, the HTTP example I used is fairly basic, but imagine if that was a Python script or a, a Ruby script that we could call in. We could call that in to any OCP environment, whether that was running Power or it's x86. The, the application configuration is the same at the end of the day. We just draw it in using a, a different base um, image which OCP will automatically have downloaded for us because it knows what environment we're running. Which is basically an overview of what we've got here. We've got our pods running applications, we've got masses. What happens if we wanted to do this? What happens if we wanted to use containers from environments without, outside of our own uh, on-premise side of things? What we're going to use public cloud? What if we wanted to use provision VMs and build VMs um, as well? VMs maybe on our on-premise stuff and Power VM, or maybe VMs out in the IBM Cloud or AWS Azure. That's where our multi-cloud manager cloud pack comes in, and with that, our cloud automation manager comes in. Now you'll notice that I've highlighted them as pods. They are as pods. When I we install IBM Cloud Pack Cloud Manager, multi-cloud manager, it's a number of pods, a large number of pods, to be fair, 20 or 30 pods. And likewise, when we install IBM Cloud Automation Manager, it's a large number of pods, 15, 20 pods but they're all part of our cluster. They're all infrastructure, effectively, applications running in our OCP cluster. And I wanted to leave this slide in because I think we've all seen this slide quite a lot recently. I'm hoping it makes a little bit more sense now. So we've got our container platform. So we've got OCP running at the bottom here, which we need. We've now got a number of pods that come in, a number of deployment configurations that the Cloud Pack basically provides. So we've got the containerized software, which actually deploys the application, and we've got containerized software that deploys things like logging, monitoring, metering, and what have you. These are all bundled together to give us a cloud pack. So all the cloud pack is, is a set of images and a set of configuration data around those images to tell it how to build the pod configuration around that application. Stop turning me, should turn that off. So here are some of the cloud packs. Not all of them are available on, on OpenShift 3v11 for power yet, but the right-hand one is the one that I want to look at today. So the cloud pack for multi-cloud manager. So we can see here that it delivers a few applications. So we've got cloud automation manager, we've got multi-cloud manager. So let's take a, a closer look at that. Now, this is the front screen from IBM multi-cloud manager cloud pack shows all our clusters across the environment. I've left this slide on because I've only got one cluster in my environment. So it looks a bit pathetic compared to this one where they've got 13 different clusters spread across AWS, Azure, Google, and IBM. We have visibility across our whole cluster here, but we also can do security and governance across our cluster. And we can automate across our cluster using a Kubernetes style um, cluster configuration. Uh, we can see the status, we can filter on various clouds should we need to. How do we install Cloud Pack Manager for multi-cloud manager? So, well, we've got our environment, our infrastructure, so whether that's our own data center, the cloud, third party, and we've installed Red Hat OpenShift Container Platform, which you've just seen. We then install the IBM Cloud Pack for multi-cloud manager, which is a number of uh, container packages. So we've got listed here. And then once we've installed that, it gives us Helm charts to be able to install additional modules, one of which is IBM Cloud Automation Manager. So the instructions to install are here. Um, it's a tar file, which contains the images and the configuration data. We untar that and we run it against a configuration file. The configuration file basically states where we want to install 
So on my example that I said we want to install these environments within on this physical server. And then we run the install which installs the cloud pack. So a quick look at that. Um, here we go. So this is IBM Cloud Pack for Multi Cloud Manager. You'll notice it's running as a pod on my cluster. So it's just a, a number of pods. We can do things like we can search all the environments. As I said, I've only got one, so it's uh, not much use to me, but I've got one unhealthy pod, which should be the same as the one you saw earlier. Yep, so I've got one unhealthy pod that is crash loop backing off, which I need to look at. But then it's got Helm releases down here, and it's got um, cluster configuration down here. So I, I can't get to my catalog screen because there we go. My catalog screen shows me a number of Helm charts that are available. And if I do a search for Cloud Automation Manager, there we go. I've imported my own cluster twice, so hence why you can see it twice. But this is a, basically a Helm chart to go away and, and build Cloud Automation Manager. Uh, click configure, go through the various options. I'm just not going to do that now as it takes some time. And once that's installed, it comes up as a Helm release within my Cloud Pack or Multi Cloud Manager interface. Here it is. Here is CAM. It tells me I've got a version update if I want it. I won't do that today. Don't worry. I click on it. I'm now taken into Cloud Automation Manager. So let's have a quick look at what Cloud Automation Manager is. So Cloud Automation Manager, for those who don't know, it's, a, it's basically an automated provision that allows us to provision VMs and uh, network interfaces and third-party integrations from a self-service portal. So it uses Terraform and Helm under the covers. It um, allows us to create services so we can then uh, use those services in like an open service broker catalog and propagate them to a, a service catalog. It communicates with multiple hybrid clouds, which I will show you. Um, and it's, uh, as I said, it's built on pods within OpenShift cluster platform. We've got the need to be able to deliver traditional type of applications. So if we look at the top right -hand corner, left hand corner here, we've got WebSphere, we've got SAP, Oracle DB. Most customers, most people would carry on want to run those for now on VM based applications. So we can do that using CAM and I'll show you how. And then it still gives us, because we're running this OpenShift container platform or Kubernetes, it still gives us the ability to run container applications uh, in, from the same service catalog. So we can still build MongoDB and WebSphere Liberty on container based applications. Cloud Automation Manager itself, I've mentioned, is made up of a number of, um, of, of containers, a number of pods, should we say, all using different images or using different configurations. And there was the chart that I showed you before about how to install it and some instructions on, on installing it. So let's have a look at CAM. So first thing we need to know about CAM, cloud connections. It allows us to have a provider connection to multiple clouds. So here we've got, I've got a cloud connection to Amazon. I've got one to IBM Cloud. I've got one to my PowerPC and I've got a local ICP cluster somewhere as well. And you'll notice here the cloud provider is quite important. So I've got Amazon AWS, IBM, and OpenStack. If we click on Create Connection, we select the provider we want. So there's quite a few options in there that we can do. We've got Azure there. We've got vSphere. Uh, and we click on, on Create. I won't do that moment, but it goes away and validates whether it get communication. What it then provides is a number of templates. Now, there are a lot of templates that come down with um, with CAM when you install it by default. Um, some of these I will show you now. So there's the IBM one. So the IBM one is, let's have a look. Uh, just go down a couple of pages. Should be something that's fairly relevant. Maybe MongoDB on a single VM within the IBM cloud. It's actually based on, let me get to that, open up on my screen. It's actually held in GitHub. So again, another external source that people can work on, people can modify should they need to. We click on it, click on it, it takes us to GitHub and it gives us the configuration files that it's going to use. Now, I won't show you these configuration files, but I want to show you ones that I'm going to create. So I've created a couple here. So let me filter on um, my templates. 
So here is an AIX 7.2 GitHub template. So I'm going to click on it and show you what I've done here. So again, it takes me to a URL within GitHub that I imported. And all I've got here, I've got a couple of Terraform files. So those that use Terraform before, Terraform goes away and builds a VM as specified in these configuration files. So if we look at the, the main temp Terraform file, click on this one, it tells me a little bit of information. So provider, so it's going to say, where are you going to go? I'm going to go to OpenStack. It's going to create a little bit of random ID, but then it's going to say, I want you to build me a compute instance using these variables called AIX VM dash random number. It's going to use an image name, a flavor name, a network name, and it's going to tell me at the end of it what my IP address is and what the VM name it gave me was. So where does it get these from? Well, within the same repository, you'll notice there is a variables file. Variables file defines what the variable names are going to be, and what description is going to be. And then I've got a cam variables JSON file. In here, I've got those variables to find. So for example, my OpenStack image name, AIX72TL2SP1. So if I go into my PowerVC, which is my, again, I can't see under my, I can't see under the, I'll have to open the ones, I can't see it. Sorry, is this the, um, the uh, web console that we're running is, is blocking some of my view. I can't see what I'm actually clicking on at the top. If I go into my PowerVC uh, interface, look at my default project. These are the images that it's looking for. So hopefully when here we'll see the AX, yeah, AX72 tail Now well, these could be IBM I images, they could be SLES images, they could be RHEL images. So any image I want to call from PowerVC this template knows about. There we go. Also, the flavor name, so the size, the infrastructure I want to call, the OpenStack name, the network name, and the IP address. Okay, so a lot of information there that we then can use. So if I wanted to, I could just deploy that template, and it would go away and deploy that template given the information I, I use. However, what I want to do, I want to create it as a service. So within my service interface, I create a new service. So let's have a look at one of these. So if we look at, um, so if I say duplicate this one, I'll just, just show you how what it looks like. Stu, there's a quick question. Um, so the, uh, Michael is asking, so Terraform is talking to PowerVC, which will deploy the AIX instance? Correct. Exactly. So the Terraform format, a uh, ter Terraform file tells it what it wants that VM to look like. That VM will then be built from the image that we've defined within the variables file. Exactly how we've asked it to do, yes. And then a follow on question How is the back end storage being handled? Is that something supported by PowerVC or is it something else handling the storage allocation? Yes, so in this case, yes, it's PowerVC. So whichever cloud provider you're getting that image from or asking, in that VM to be built with, it's using that backend storage provider as well. So in our case, PowerVC is doing exactly what you would do if you clicked on the image within PowerVC and did a build. Mm -hmm. it's, just, it's just important that information from a Terraform flat file. Okay, thank you. So within um, uh, our um, service information, what we can do here, we can drag templates that we've created. So if I look at a one I've created that basically will go away and do where did there's one I just showed you now. So there's my AX72 GitHub one. I drag that in there. I can give it variable names. I can alter it as I, I see fit. I can then maybe I've, I've got an IBM. Well, I know I'm running out of time, so I'm going to skip on a little bit here because I've got an IBM one that I created earlier, which is the same. Um, here we go. So I've got IBM2 GitHub entry. I place that in there. I can do things like just let that screen refresh. I've got Helm charts that I could pull in from ICP. I've got REST API hooks that I could put in. Oh, yeah, put on in there. I've got decision trees that I could put in there saying uh, this is when case one, do this, case two, do that. So I can build up 
a th th this this um, canvas effectively and then publish it as I saw fit. So if we look at the ones that I've already done, I've got two here. Let me look at the published ones. So once I've published them, they can then go out. So I've got an AX721, which all it does is deploy an AX72 image. And then I've got one here, which is a hybrid multi-cloud application. If I do a quick look at this and view it, you'll see from the composition that it's very similar to what I was just doing on the canvas a minute ago, where I've got my IBM Cloud, got a little bit bigger. It's grayed out because I published it, so I can't change it. I've got IBM Cloud, so it's going to go away and build two IBM Cloud VMs, and then it's going to go and build an, a an Oracle um, database on AX within my um, uh, on-premise information. So once I publish those, what then happens is that then appear in my OpenShift catalog. So going back to my catalog here, you notice all these deployment configuration templates that I had earlier. If I filter for just IBM based ones, here's the ones I created. So if I ask for an AIX72 VM, it tells me what it's going to do. AIX72 Power VM LPAR on premises. All it wants to know, oh, I did create select plan and all of that. So let's call this AIX BUG1. It's just the instance name, it's not the VM name. And I go away and create that. It will go and start doing the deployment. And there we see it starting at the moment. Likewise, if I go away and filter and choose the, the hybrid cloud one, it tells me here. So I'm going to dual Linux VMs on Airbnb Public Cloud and Oracle Database on premise. Again, that back end one can be IBM I, it can be SLED, it can be RHEL, as long as it's a VM within PowerVC or an image within PowerVC. So I tried to call this hybrid one and create that we'll see that they, those two builds have started. If I click on the dashboard link, it actually takes me to Cloud Automation Manager and shows me the progress on the log file. So there we go, it started doing the build of my AAX VM. It's told me all the information it's gonna use, the, um, the image name, the VLAN name, the name it's gonna create will be up at the top somewhere, I must have missed it. So if I go onto my PowerVC now, look at my VMs and I think I was calling it there you go so now there's my AX VM being built exactly as it would if, as if I just used an image within my VM it's, I don't have any configuration in there because that's all in the Terraform file likewise the other one that I clicked on earlier so I the hybrid multi-cloud one if I go into the dashboard there it takes me to cloud automation manager the log file there should tell me it started doing the build so it started doing the build of Debian VM1 and Ubuntu VM1, and it should be in the IBM Cloud. So if I go onto my IBM Cloud, it's not my IBM Cloud account, I've lost that one as well. My IBM Cloud account. While it's um, coming up, Stuart, there's a couple more questions. Is there a special Terraform provider used, or will it be OpenStack? Just, just OpenStack. Yeah, that's what I thought. Uh, is OpenShift Manager talking to Cloud Automation Manager, which is using Terraform to execute to PowerVC? Uh, yes. Um, when we say is OpenShift Cluster Platform talking to Cloud Automation Manager, then Cloud Automation Manager is an application running within OCP. So yes, it has a, um, a service broker catalog to be able to communicate with um, OCP. So effectively, yes. And there are, my, there are the two VMs that have now started being built in my cloud product. And once it's finished those, obviously we're not gonna have time today to say it, but because those take about three or four minutes, it will then obviously start my Oracle database server on my PowerVC at the end as well. Oof, right. I am... Um, let me just, I, I can't see if there's any more questions. I don't know how to bring up the, uh, the question. Uh, that's okay. Yeah, so um, just one more, which is um, can PowerVC also provision containers as well as provisioning a new AIX VM? No. So PowerVC can't. Um, 
in the in the automation manager catalog before where I showed the um, the services and I did the I did the uh, let me just duplicate that one I, I duplicate it what we can do within here which I've, I've, I've not got an example of, but I, I can maybe put a video up in the next uh, couple of weeks, um, is within a composition, when I drag a REST hook into here, I'm putting a, I could put in the HTTP server of the API server. So the, the OCP server could go in here. I could then do a post, and then I could do a payload in here where I call up default configuration, deployment configuration, sorry. So we can build a service where a service can go away and do a container build it can do a public cloud build and then it can do a private cloud build as well all within one catalog service excellent um I, uh, you've covered a vast amount of information and you make it look fairly easy um if somebody out there is uh, wanting some assistance in any of the things that you've talked about, of course. what should they do? Well, I've, um, so I've got my, um, obviously, speak to your friendly local IBM representative, but uh, I've my details are there. If you want to drop me an email or look at me on Twitter or LinkedIn, then I can try and answer you back. Um, yeah, so ha happy to help. Um, again, your CTS team, Joe, that you work for, got a lot of knowledge mm -hmm. around OpenShift as well, so you guys can assist, but always happy sure. to help if you want to reach out. Thank you so much, Stu. Um, and I'm afraid we've both got commitments, so we need to jump on other other things. So we're going to have to call it a day. So thank you all very much for joining. And if you do have questions, as Stu said, fire them uh, at us via email or um, via LinkedIn or Twitter. Uh, just uh, going to stop the recording.